Well, today, as you know, is Father's Day. And I want to share with you on the topic of a father's uh, prayer, a father's prayer. I remember when I became a dad for the first time. Uh, It was an eventful day, to say the least. I was rehearsing with a band, getting ready for uh, a weekend worship uh, event that we were having, and uh, my wife calls me and she says, I need you to come home. Uh, My stomach doesn't feel well. Now, she was only seven months into the pregnancy, still had two more months to go, um, and she thought, uh, obviously, the White Castle we had last night didn't sit well with me. Uh, right away, we want to blame White Castle, and we want to blame their what we call murder burgers, but I will tell you that's some of the finest meat you will ever have. Just kidding, obviously. But she thought it was White Castle that was trying to get out of her. It turns out it was our first son, Jaden, that was actually trying to make a, a move. So she calls me, we go to the hospital, and certainly seven months into the pregnancy, we're not thinking that she's going to give birth today. But when we get to the hospital, she's telling the doctor how she feels. The doctors come and check her out and say, honey, uh, we have to tell you that you will be having this baby today. And she's like, what, today? I haven't, I haven't even done the Lamas classes yet, was the first thing she can think of. And, and I'm like, well, honey, plenty of women have had birth, have, you know, delivered a baby without Lamas, by the way. She goes, I, I don't have a bag ready. Things aren't ready. And, and I said, well, we, we, this is what it is. But the doctors, as you might realize, told us, listen, there's only about an 80% chance survival rate for a baby that is born premature. And you might think, well, 80% is pretty good, and it is, it's a pretty good number, but 20%, it's a pretty big number too, when you're a parent that wants 100% survival rate. But he tells us there's about an 80%, and we're thinking, well, you know, it is what it is, and we did everything we could, the doctors did everything they could to prolong the birth, but they said, uh, uh, we gotta, you know, it's gonna happen, so they started with steroids, try to give, give the baby the best fighting chance, so she did, a few hours after the doctor spoke to us, gave birth to our firstborn son, and uh, I remember that night going back home, just driving back home, just uh, crying out to God, thanking God for the birth of our child. Of course, still praying because there was still some uncertainty, still praying that he'd make it, that everything would go well. Um, But nonetheless, realizing that just like that, my life had changed forever. That no longer would I be just Robert, but now I would be a father for the first time. And my life really did change. I I felt the weight of the responsibility, but I also felt God. And I remember thanking God for that. I remember the feeling, and if you're not a dad and you happen to be watching this or you're here, um, let me tell you what it felt like for me. Becoming a dad kind of felt like nine months of going uphill on a roller coaster. It felt like nine months. And then the day our son was born, it felt like that first moment when you're on that roller coaster and it's about to go downhill really fast. That's what it felt like. Like all of a sudden I'm feeling like I better brace because this is about to lose control. I'm about to not be in as much control as I was before because Let's face it, when you're a single young man, uh, pretty much you're in control. But now, when you have to parent a child, it's almost like a roller coaster ride. Like, oh my gosh, what am I getting myself into? But it's too late for you to now go back. You're in it. See, control is something, I don't know about you, but I know that I like it. And I think that you like it. And if men are like I am, uh, I think most men, most dads probably like some control, a sense of control uh, in their lives. But uh, how many of you know that control is actually an illusion, that we really do not have control of our lives? Now, that's not my insight. 
That is the insight of two people that shared with me recently, having gone through some illness, telling me both on separate occasions, saying to me, you know what? Control is an illusion. It's not real. And when you're a parent, you realize control is an illusion. I don't care if you try to be helicopter dad, helicopter mom. If you really think that you can control your children, the reality is is that they grow older and you soon find out, I really don't have as much control as I thought I had. But as a parent, what do you do in those moments? What do you do in those moments really matters as a dad. What you do in those moments really matters when you're out of control and you're the father. What you do really matters. Today I'm going to talk to you about a Roman official that was out of control. He was in a situation that he could no longer control. Now, if I'm telling you he's a Roman official in Scripture, what I'm really telling you is that this is a man that when he said jump, the only appropriate answer was how high. This was a man that was in full control. But this Roman official found himself in a situation where he was out of control, and it was because of his son. And he needed someone to take control of the situation. The story I'm talking to you about is in John chapter 4, beginning at verse 46. I want to read it for you quickly. It says this. So he came again to Cana in Galilee. This is speaking of Jesus. Jesus came to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine at Capernaum. There was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So we have this Roman official, someone that is used to demanding, not asking. He is coming to Jesus, and he is now asking Jesus for his son, for the healing of his son. And the reason he's asking for this is because his son is ill and is about to die. This man is saying, listen, my son needs more than I can provide. My son needs more than I can give. And let me tell you something. As a dad, I know that for us men, there is one thing that we take full pride on, and it's the provision that we provide our families with. That to us is an honor. And when we cannot provide for our family, that stresses us out. This man wanted to provide healing for his son, but he recognized that his son is now at the point of death And he knows for the first time, I don't have control, but I know someone who can help. Now, by the way, lest you think that it's a bad thing that you hunger for control, I want you to know that you were actually, you were created uh, to dominate. Men and women were created for control. When we read in Genesis chapter 1, what is the word of God tell us? God said that we were to control, to subdue the earth, to, to care for it, to have dominion over it. So it's a, it's a natural tendency in, in us to, to want to control situations. But how many of you know that as much as we can control, there is one that has ultimate dominion? That God over us has ultimate dominion. This is what this Roman official understood, that he didn't have dominion over life and death, but God did. So he runs to Jesus. So Jesus said to him, and watch this, he says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Unless you see signs and wonders, you would not believe. Now, I don't know about you, and I love Jesus, and I don't want you to strike me down or anything like that, but that sounds a little rude. It's like, what? Like, what are you talking about? Like, like I'm coming to you because my son is dying, and, and you, you, you decide to lecture me in this vulnerable moment to tell me that I need to see things uh, in order to believe them? Like, like what, what are you talking about? Could you imagine coming to Jesus? My child is about to die. And he says, well, you don't believe unless you see stuff. A little rude. 
And by the way, he wasn't just talking to the Roman official. He was talking to everyone that was there. This is what the official says to Jesus. He says to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Now, I want you to, to get that tension. I want you to see the tension there. Jesus goes to uh, scolding him, at least mildly scolding this man. And this man just responds and he says, I don't know what you're talking about. Just heal my son. Just come down and heal my son. In, in my mind, I'm thinking about this man, and I'm thinking this man must be saying to himself, what? Right now, I don't know what I believe. What I do know is that my son is sick. What I do know is that my son is dying. And what I do know is that I need you to come and heal him. I need you to come. So he says, uh, sir, come down before my child dies. And Jesus says to him, it's an awkward conversation, by the way, if, uh, I, I think at least. Jesus says to him, go, your son will live. Just go, your son will live. Jesus does not come down. All he does is say, go, it's going to be fine. Go, he's going to live. The man believed. You, you should highlight that word. Because the Bible says the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. That's powerful stuff. That the man said, he's going to be okay? Good. Let's go. And he starts back home. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them, the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, uh, yesterday at about the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and his whole household believed as well. So the man says, what time? He goes, oh, about the seventh hour. That's exactly when I met with Jesus. I want to show you just three observations from this passage that I think are helpful. Just three things. And they, they start with ABC. You can call this the ABCs of, of parenting, uh, maybe. The first thing is that a father's prayer, the first thing that we must do, men, is that we must admit limitations. We must A, admit that we have limits. Now, I know that as men, we don't want to have limits. I mean, I will watch 37 YouTube videos before I ask someone about something that they know well. I mean, I will try to figure it out myself before, and, and here's the, the pride thing, and you can judge me if you want, but, but that's not cool. Uh, but you can judge me if you want. But the reality is, before I ask another man... I will try to figure it out myself. But Rob, you know nothing about plumbing. Let me, let me do this. But Rob, you, you don't know nothing about carpentry. I, I'll figure this thing out. But Rob, why don't you ask our neighbor? You think I'm going to ask? Our neighbor, I'm the provider in this house. I'm the one. And listen, and listen, wives, please, please do us a favor. Do not ask another man in our presence. Do not do that. That, that just, our pride goes, it just disappears. Because frankly, if, if we're honest, we don't like to admit our limitations. But men, the reality is, and we know it, is that we do have limitations. We do have things that we don't know about. I, I get it that we want to be the provider. We want to be the one that has the answers. But the truth is that we have our limits. And in those moments of limits, the, the best thing that we can do is simply admit them. Again, this is a Roman official that was used to demanding. What does he do? He admits that he has a limitation. I can't work when it comes to life and death, but I know a man that does. And he admitted his limitation. Let me tell you something about limitations. Limitations, or at least admitting your limitations, the sooner you do it, the better it is for you. 
The sooner you get to admitting it, the sooner uh, and the better it is. The sooner you will solve your problem. Number two is that the sooner you get to it, the sooner you admit your limitation is the sooner that you can tap into God's unlimited power in your life. Jeremiah 33 says this. It says, uh, God saying to us, call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. When you have a limitation, one of the things is that you want to do is you want to come to God in prayer if your children aren't acting right, you want to go to God in prayer as a father and you want to acknowledge, uh, listen, uh, God, I need help here because I, I, I don't have the resources within myself. The sooner we do it, the better. And the sooner we do it, the sooner we get to tap into God's unlimited resources. Paul himself the great Paul that we talk about all the time, who wrote most of the New Testament, Paul himself said, he, he's talking and he's saying to the Corinthian church, he's saying, listen, I want you to know that there was a thorn in my flesh. There was a problem that I was having that I could not overcome. And I prayed for this problem. I prayed for this thorn to go away. But God actually kept the thorn there. He kept the problem there. And he says the reason God kept that problem there is so that I wouldn't become conceited. How many of you know that the reason you're not perfect, the reason I'm not perfect, is because God doesn't want us to get conceited. He wants us to always depend on him and his strength alone. So he says, listen, Paul, I'm not going to remove the thorn. I'm not going to remove the problem. You're going to live with that problem. And he says to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, he says, Paul, Paul you, this is what I want you to know. My grace is sufficient for you. Dad, when you're in a situation when, that you feel like you cannot control and you're, you're thinking, okay, I don't have the resources, I can't do this, why don't you depend on the grace of God for your life? Because His grace is sufficient for you. It's sufficient for us. It's sufficient for us. He says, my grace is sufficient for you. And this is why. This is God speaking. He says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power, the moment that we admit that we don't have it, and the moment that we say, God, I need to tap into your unlimited resources, that's the moment that God gets to work, and all of a sudden, we start seeing his power. So when we are weak, when we are weak, we should be content about our weakness. Let's continue reading. He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Man, it's time that we started saying, I'm going to boast not about my strengths, but I'm going to boast about my weaknesses because it's in my weaknesses that God gets to work. And it's when God gets to be glorified in my life. And dad, you will have a moment in your life or many moments in your life where you're going to realize I don't have the resources I need from my family. I don't have it. I don't have it all together. It's not all there, but oh, it's so good to know. It's so good to know that once I admit that, God is right there, ready to say, wait, Rob, or wait, Freddie, or wait, Andrew, or wait, whoever. Uh, he, he, that's when God says, I'm about to show off right now, and you're about to see my goodness in full effect. So he says, I boast in my weakness. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Men, the first thing we need to do is admit our weaknesses. A father's prayer admits, I don't have it all together, God. I need your help. The second thing is that a father's prayer, and this one starts with a B, a father's prayer believes without evidence. Believes without evidence. And, and you might say, what? Are you serious? Like, are you going to believe stuff without, without any evidence? You know, are you telling me that I need to have blind faith? And you know what the reality is, is that I'm going to say, yeah. Yeah, you, you can believe God blindly. 
What, what did Jesus do when this man came to him? What did Jesus say to him? He says, you, you, you need to see. Unless you see signs and wonders, you don't even believe. And you're like, yeah, but when it comes to God, shouldn't I be able to see before I believe? I'm going to say no. And this is the reason I'm going to say no. Because you don't generally practice that most of your life. Most of the things in your life, you don't generally need so much evidence to believe. Let, let me tell you what I mean. I met um, Tino Walenda. Some of you may know the name, others may not. Uh, Tino Walenda is a skywalker. It's one of these guys that uh, does tightrope walking from like, sometimes they do it, they generally do it in circuses, but sometimes they get a little nutty and they decide to do it outdoors, like in between buildings and, you know, uh, Nick Walenda, which is actually his nephew, crossed the Grand Canyon on a type rope. Uh, he's, he also did, a, I think in Guatemala, I think he did a, a volcano that he crossed as well. You know, that is crazy, but he did that. So Tina Walenda their entire family does this stuff. They, it's kind of like their family business. They're a circus family. And I had the opportunity to meet Tino Walenda. And when I met him, it wasn't just like, you know, I met him, he signed something, and I walked away. We actually talked and interacted, uh, had a card ride together. So I, I had a little bit of more meaningful conversations with Tino Walenda. And um, when I spoke to Tino Walenda, you know, I'm talking to him about this whole tight rock walking thing. Like, like, why are you doing this? Like, this is crazy. Have you heard of flat surfaces? You know, there are better options, like airplanes. Like, you know, you could do something different with your life. Um, at the time, I was driving, and I was a lot younger, so I'm not as experienced a driver. And he told me, he says, I'm actually, I'm more apprehensive about this car ride than I am about the tight rope. <laughs> um, but... One of the things he told me in our conversation, he told me that before he does a tight rope walk, he goes to both sides, even though he has other people that are helping him set this up, he goes on both ends and he secures the rope. He tests it, he makes sure that everything is right. Um, one of the reasons is that his own grandfather actually passed away in Puerto Rico and fell off of a tightrope uh, doing a walk in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, so he, he says, I myself, I go check the rope every time I do this. Now, that is prudent, very wise to do, but it's not something that we mostly do in our everyday lives, Right? Like you, this morning, uh, before you got into your car, you did not check the brakes. I mean, you didn't really check the brakes. Maybe you walked around the car, if you even did that. But what you probably did is that you opened the door, you turned the car on, and you just went. You had no idea if someone messed with your brakes, messed with your tires all night last night. You have no idea. You just got in your car and went. You walked into this building without any evidence that this building will stay up, and now you're going to get freaked out. I get it. But you didn't test the structure. You didn't say before, I go in here, let me just make sure that this building, let me just take a look and make sure that this roof is not going to collapse on me. Let me make sure. None of you did that. We didn't do that. We walked in here without any evidence that, that what we were walking into was a safe environment. Sure, we've seen it stand up before, but we don't know that it will stand up today. All right, I'll, I'll make this sermon a little faster because I could sense the anxiety building in, your, <laughs> in you right now. It, it's going to be okay, guys. What I'm getting at is that we believe many things without, without seeing the evidence. And sometimes I think we need to believe God without being able to see anything. And I believe that God actually wants us to trust him sometimes without there being anything to see. A father's prayer prays even when he has not seen the evidence. I, I, this man, what, th he had this conversation with Jesus. Jesus says, you don't believe unless you see. He says, sir, just come, save, you know, just save my son's life. And then Jesus tells him, and what does the man do? He simply believes. All Jesus gave him was a word that your son will live, 
and this man walked. He says, I believe. I believe. I trust. There will come times in your life where you won't know to believe or not. I believe that. I believe that there will be times in your life, Dad, when you will be in a situation that you don't know, do I believe God or do I not believe God? The answer is simple. You believe God. Whether I have the evidence or not, whether I see it with my eyes or not, I will believe God. My, my child will live. I will believe you, God. But right now, it doesn't look like my child is going to live, but, but I will believe you, God. It doesn't look like things are going to work out. What is our responsibility? We keep believing God. We're just going to believe God. Even if it doesn't look like it's going to happen, we believe God. Hebrews 11.1 1 is the best definition for faith and it says now faith is this is what faith is it's the assurance of things that we hope for it's the assurance of what we hope for and it's the conviction of things not seen when did we get it in our minds that we have to see to believe God says you do not need to see to believe you just need to believe third thing is that a father's prayer comprehends the process. A father's prayer comprehends the process. Now, when you read this story quickly, there's a word that you missed. Uh, how do I know? Because I missed it. And I've read this passage over and over again. But there is a detail in this story that's easy to miss. Here's the detail. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. What's the detail? Most of you probably, when we first read it, thought his son was healed. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that his son began recovering. What does that tell us? That there's a process. That you could be praying for your child and you're saying, yeah, but my child didn't change. Yeah, you're right. But your child may be changing. It may be a process of recovery. Now, don't get me wrong. I want God to answer my prayers yesterday. I want God to answer my prayers right now. Like my child is dying right now. Like I need him to be completely healed right now. He says, no, he's going to be healed, but there's a process. There's going to be recovery. There's going to be a time of recovering. We want God to answer immediately. But when we pray as fathers, even when we pray as moms, we need to realize that there's a time, that there's a time. And this is exactly why the word of God just values uh, that time. Isaiah says that they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. There is a time. It's not that God can't do it in the moment. It's that sometimes I believe God wants to do a process in us. And not for God, but for us. We need a process. We need time. Those that wait upon the Lord. It's when we wait upon God that He begins to renew our strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So a father's prayer, again, three things. Number one, admits admits that we have limits. Number two, believes God. Even when there is no evidence, or maybe no, you, you feel like there's no reason to believe. There's nothing that I see in front of me that indicates that this will happen. And number three, he comprehends that there's a process. You understand that it's not all going to happen in one shot. You know, I think our biggest problem is not so much that we're not understanding the process or that we're not admitting our limits or that we're not believing God. I think for some of us, our biggest problem is that we're not praying. We're not bringing our children to God. 
we have problems with our children and we think, I am going to solve this problem. I am going to put my big boy pants on and I'm going to show them and I'm going to get this situation under control. But this situation may be out of your control. Here's my question. Are you praying, Dad? Are you praying for your children? And I know that this is something that, uh, that many children will often say, Oh, it was the prayers of my mother. When I was out there, it was the prayers of my mother that kept me. It was the prayers of my grandmother that kept me. Listen, I am determined to change that. I want it to be, it was the prayers of my father. I think there should be a difference. I wonder if our fathers started praying, if it would make any difference. Moms, you keep praying. Grandmas, you keep praying. But grandfathers, fathers, what if we said, I want my children to say it was the prayers of my father that kept me. God was listening to the prayers of my father. Is it that we're not praying? Dads, stop trying to control the situation and let's start going to God in prayer. Let's start saying, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle the children. I don't know how it's all going to work out. But you are in control, sovereign. You are sovereign over all things. God, you control this situation. And my second question for you is simple. How are you praying for your children? Are you praying with a recognition that you have limits? Are you going to God and saying, God, I, I can't do it, but you can? Are you believing God, even though there's no evidence, nothing that shows or proves that you should be believing God? There's plenty of examples in Scripture of people that went ahead and believed God, even though there was no evidence that God would actually do what he said he would do. But they believed God, and when the time was right, God did what he was going to do, but it took them journeying through faith. And number three, can you comprehend that there's a process? It's not going to happen all in one shot. That's why we stay steady in prayer. So just to make it very simple, ABC parents, Fathers, admit your limits. B, believe God. C, comprehend the process. That is a father's prayer. Dad, um, I don't want to beat you up. The world does enough of that to us men. Um, and I believe that there's some good Christian men who love God. I believe that there's some jokers out there for sure. But I also believe that there's some good Christian men, and I believe I'm looking at them right here in this sanctuary. Men, my encouragement to you today. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, ladies. Men, my encouragement to you today is to simply tell you, you can tap into God's unlimited power if you're willing to acknowledge that there is limits in you. You can see the hand of God move the moment you start believing. And if you're willing to commit to a process, then men, let's not let the ladies win this one out. I mean, women, continue to pray. But let not our children say that it was the prayers of our mothers. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But man, I'm dying for the day where I hear a young man, a young woman said, say, you know what? My mom prayed, my grandma prayed, but it was the prayers of my dad that kept me and now have me here today. Men, let it be our prayers. Let it be our prayers that make a difference in our children's lives. Amen? Let's pray.